All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I want to welcome Sharon Berkman Fink and Jean Kelly to our show today. Uh, we're going to be in online format so that we can record the program, and we have a lot of people watch the program after the fact. You can always go to PursePower.com on the Let's Share the Journey tab, and you can see all of our prior videos. They're all there. Um, and I post the upcoming session every Monday for every Friday, so you can go there to find out who's going to be on the show. Um, please introduce yourselves on chat. Let's go ahead and do that. And then we do a networking session every fourth Friday of the month normally. Given the holidays, we're gonna go ahead and do the next one on the 19th. And that's a live session where you get to know people across the country and we do some networking and sharing. First Power is working to help women use their massive purchasing power to drive positive change. We believe that if women who make 80% of all purchasing decisions would choose to buy from the companies that actively promote women, and we would do that in mass, and we could create a funding stream for battered women's shelters that we could shatter glass ceilings and change lives. So that's what First Power is trying to do. Um, I want to shout out to our special guests, and one of them is, is going to be interviewing our uh, Sharon this morning, and Gene Kelly is one of our investors and actually the first one. So I appreciate all of our investors and board members online. Um, Gene Kelly is the founder of College Major Finder, and she's our sponsor today. Um, she's a Berkman consultant who's interviewed over 15,000 people in her career. Um, she recently founded College Major Finder to help parents save money by ensuring that their kids pursue the degree and career that's the best match for them. So I'll introduce everybody, or I'll introduce Jean. Jean will introduce Sharon. <clears throat> Pardon me. Please ask your questions via the, the Q&A box at the bottom, um, and we'll try to incorporate them in the discussion. Jean is a solopreneur, and she was 26 years old when she, she started Jean Kelly Personnel. She was 31 when she started Jean Kelly Training and Consulting, and 36 years old when she started JK Temps. Um, in 2000, she graduated from Harvard Business School's Executive MBA program as did our guest today. In 2001, after selling her staffing company, she began executive coaching full-time. Jean's coached both willing and unwilling executives, um, but her favorite things to do is to work with young people. She's an expert on baby boomers, Gen Xers, millennials, and now folks in the Gen Z generation. And she's got a grandson in that age group, so she's got a front row seat. Jean is interested in everything from geology to world religion. She has five books to her name, and as a result of long-term board relationship at Goodwill in Tulsa, her recent book, Nearing a Second Printing, is named Dress Like a Million from Goodwill. She's a continuous adventurer. She's a competitive sports car driver, dog trainer, antique Navajo rug collector. Um, she's amazing. Jean's an icon in our state. I'm thrilled to death to have her here. I call her a friend as well as one of my mentors. And um, one time she was asked if she could explain herself in one sentence. And she said, yes, I have a purple Jeep Wrangler with a Persian rug. So welcome, Jean. Thank you for being here. And I'll take it away. I have something to add. And I have five turtles. Oh, yeah, five turtles. <laughs> <Okay>. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm tickled today uh, to be able to introduce Sharon Berkman Fink. And by the way, happy Friday. Thank you for being here. Sharon is both a colleague and a friend, and I knew her long before she took over the, the main re leadership role at Berkman International. She is the chairman there and also the CEO. Uh, she has an MA from the University of Texas and an EMBA, like me, from Harvard Business School. And you can check out the website and find out all the things that Berkman and Sharon individually has won. But my favorite things, um, they won the best and brightest company to work for in their area for six years consecutively. I think that's a pretty big deal. Also recently, um, the Houston Business Journal awarded her an honor um, women who mean business, and um, the, is I, is it most recently? When was uh, the Ian Ian E Y? Uh, Earth e -Y yes, family business was twenty sixteen. Okay, and she won the Entrepreneur of the Year there. And you know the way this Berkman story starts is with her father, and I think it's important for. Um, us to tell that story because it, it makes a big difference having that construct in our heads when we think about the instrument that has changed so many 
lives. And um, her father was a B-17 pilot in World War II. He was an instructor as well. He was shot down over Belgium, managed to escape Nazi forces, and his wartime experience shaped Sharon, Sharon's mother, and Sharon's daughter's entire futures. And actually, I wouldn't be celebrating 41 years of marriage if it weren't for the Berkman assessment. Um, and I'm kind of a, an assessment junkie. But I will let Sharon tell you a little bit, a little bit about her, her dad and, and how this came to be. Sharon? Well, you know, he was from a very, very long lineage of pastors, Lutheran pastors. So it was naturally assumed that he would also help people through the ministry. But along came World War II. So in the midst of his college career, he, he enrolled in the, in the Air Force and was given a pilot of a B-17 bomber with nine crewmen. And so as a young 23-year-old, it was his first real experience in being the leader of a team. And what he noted when they would come back from each of their life and death missions, knowing that there was a 50% chance each of those planes would never come back alive, um, they would have a compulsory debrief session. During those sessions, he noted as a young man that the perception of each man in his crew, as they described the events that they had just survived, was truthful and accurate, but each man described what had just transpired in a slightly different way. Essentially, he saw they were perceiving through their own eyes and their own individual uh, interests and priorities. And Years, you know, as he came back to the United States and decided that his real passion and his quote unquote ministry would not be the clergy, it was going to be that brand new and exciting field called social psychology. Now, what we're so used to it all these decades later, but at that time in the late 40s, early 50s, the Ivy League schools were just starting to realize that psychology slash psychiatry should not be limited to people who were being treated for mental health Ill issues, mental illness, in other words. That in fact, you could take some of the, the important points of social psychology, you could take that into the workforce and really help uh, functioning, normal, as we say, functioning people, healthy workers become even more productive by understanding themselves and one another more accurately. So he really got excited about the idea that if you could uh, ask people questions about how they saw themselves and as he'd learned in the war, how they perceived others on their team in their lives and the world around them, the important people they live and work with, if you knew how they perceived them, you would actually have a powerful way to understand them more accurately and more fully with less, less defensiveness and less judgment. So he created these questions and he went out and he interviewed everybody who would sit still, you know, whether it was a salesman, an engineer, a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, all of these people in different professions. Because remember, this was really, he was thinking, this is something that's going to go into each workplace. What came out of it was his doctoral dissertation called A Test of Social Comprehension. And I say that because most personality assessments, or as we, is they're known in the vernacular, a personality test, is pretty effective by asking you questions about yourself. And people will generally be quite honest. And, and the information that a, a Myers-Briggs or a Hogan or, or any of these other, or DISC, what they get back is strengths finders, all of these that are well known, is useful and it's true. And Berkman calls that our usual positive behavior. What's different for us, though, is that we go beyond asking about just yourself and we ask how you see most people. How do you see world, the world of people that you live and work in? 
what we discovered is that when you combine those two, it literally is like enabling an individual to see through both eyes. And so really uh, a, a power of the Berkman method, and I think truly why we're still here this year celebrating 70 years since he incorporated his little tiny company with my mom and one typist. And boy, was it laborious in those days. But, you know, here we are 70 years later with all this technology that makes it possible to, to score thousands per day or per month. Um, and in those days, manually, he could knock out maybe three a day with, yeah. with, with my mom and a typist. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the reason, Gene, why we're here is that we, we actually go to a three-dimensional view of each individual who takes the Berkman. By that, I mean, we look at what interests them, what kind of jobs, what kind of tasks motivate them, keep them engaged. And so that's one dimension. We look at what I mentioned before, how they show up in a positive way, their strengths. We call that usual. And we look, and this is really our secret sauce. We look at those underlying needs that truly motivate and keep us recharged. By that, I mean, I think the easiest example of what I'm talking about is to just picture a, a normal tree. And so it doesn't matter what kind of tree it is. If you are the least bit knowledgeable about a tree, you can distinguish between an oak and a palm tree simply by looking at it. You, you look at what's sticking up above the ground. That's what you get from most personality assessments. And again, it's not wrong. It's, it's good information. But if you want to really take good care of that tree, you also need to make sure that the roots are healthy. It's the roots, it's those under, what we call those underlying motivating needs that keep that tree blossoming green in the right way, that keep it healthy. And when the roots are healthy, the tree will thrive. So in a nutshell, uh, Berkman is measuring that part of the needs that you don't see, those root systems under the, under the ground that we know is there, but we don't easily see them. Just as that is with people, we know those, those motivating needs are there, but we don't easily articulate them to others. And unless people know us really, really well, they can't see that. Yes, and, um, and also the earth, the soil, the environment mm -hmm. makes a big difference in a tree. So yeah. like us, the environment makes a big difference in how we behave. So it's it's um, it's not as complex as it sounds. Yeah, I like the, I yeah. like the tree analogy. It doesn't, but you know what we also found. If if you go back to our tree again, what happens in a drought over time is that those roots are deprived of water. So the tree doesn't die overnight. But if the drought continues day after day, week after week, you're going to see the signs of stress occur for that tree. In a similar way, what we tell people is when, when our needs go unmet over a cumulative prolonged period of time, people begin to show stress. And what we can measure is how they can recognize and take care of getting out of that stressful behavior and go back to their good, positive, usual selves. Yeah. Um, like, like many women that are probably listening today, men too, but I'm thinking about women who make midlife changes and mm. yours was quite dramatic. <laughs> I mean, you're more dramatic than anyone I've ever known. Tell us about that. Well, you know, my, my parents founded the company and I knew about the Berkman method growing up because when you're in a little family business, you live and breathe it. Uh, so I understood the instrument. I would come in now and then and, and you know, I did summer, summer jobs in college working for Berkman, but it was always thought for me that my, my true passion and vocation was actually music and musical theater. So I got my degree in opera production. I ended up marrying an international opera singer who's been touring the world for the last 30 years. 
won a Grammy and I had a ball doing nothing but music, really, and raising my three girls. What happened, though, is when my dad was in his 80s and I began to see that my parents' legacy, it was always very important to me. But I started to see that if I didn't go into the company and start learning now that my youngest was in school all day, she was in third grade at the time. I wanted to help my parents because I so believed in their mission and what they've been doing and what they've given their life to. So I sympathized with it. But honestly, I saw myself as an artist and not a business person in any way. So, yes, it was a, it was a major encore career for me, a major pivot. But what happened is, is I stepped in mainly just to make sure that when my parents were no longer there each day, the company could be passed on in a meaningful, productive way. After I started coming in daily, I started getting really involved and interested and thought, you know what? One day I, I walked into my dad's office a couple of years after going in full time and said, I think that I might be ready. And, and, and the truth is that I saw him about to a point, a really nice guy, a psychologist, but I didn't feel that this individual, I was, I guess, brazen and confident enough to say, I don't think he's the right guy. How about me? <laughs> and we <laughs> had a little bit of a revolving door at that point of leadership as my dad struggled frankly, with a succession plan. Because, you know, when you're a founder, it's your baby. It was very, he was 80, whoa, 82 at the time. It's really hard, though, to step away and turn it over to someone else. And I thought, well, he's not going to fire me, probably, because, you know, I'm his blood. Uh, so I thought, you know what, how hard can it be? I can learn business. So ROI, what does that mean exactly? You know, I, and I started on a really warp speed course in business. Harvard was a big help, to be honest, because it really did give me over those three years, a wonderful uh, opportunity to interact with other executives and, and do case studies and, and really gain uh, a, 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 an amazing amount of confidence. However, let me quickly add, ladies and gentlemen, I do believe that you learn the best by doing it. You can read case studies and books on business all day long, but I have learned so much from my failures as well as, as the things that went well. And trust me, there will be failures. You just have to put on your big girl boots and, and climb back in and, and do it again. Each day, just keep going in. Persistence is a big factor. What do you wish you'd known in 2002 that you know now? Oh, my goodness. What a question. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I think each you never stop learning, as you know, Jean. And I think that all good leaders have to be humble about the fact that it, it's really clear to me that I can only be as good as the team that's surrounding and, and working with me and supporting me. Um, I can go out and represent the heart and the and the soul and the purpose behind Berkman, but truly it's my team that day in and day out make it happen in an operational way. Uh, so I put my my CPA, my accountant, she's on a pedestal around here. So is my <laughs> IT guy. You know, I will kneel at their feet because they they are why we can be a true company. You have to have a team. You don't do it by yourself. Well, and in some respects, you kind of work for them. Yeah, you do. Uh, they work yeah. for you. Exactly. You know? if, for those yeah. of, if you've heard the term servant leadership, yeah, I, I really believe in that. In fact, during COVID, which was a dark time because I am a real people person, and I was hurting by, not, by sending the people to work from home. And, and we did. We did almost immediately. We had the technology. So we just moved into our big, beautiful, new dream office suite. And suddenly, before the boxes were even unpacked, everybody's going with their little laptops, trundling off. And I'm not seeing him except on a Zoom screen now and then. So I was pretty traumatized, to be honest. But um, but I decided I'd rewrite our mission, our, what, what our culture and the words we live by really are. And the five words that I came up with that really define our culture here at Berkman were inclusive, 
you know, that all, not just, uh, this was, you know, the summer of Black Lives Matter. And mm -hmm. so there was a lot of talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's a, and it still is a really important topic. But inclusiveness also for us means inclusiveness of all different kinds of personalities and interests. And that is irregardless of gender or, or generational differences or, um, you know, in, or country differences. What we see is people indeed are more alike than they are different. And yet the, these, these differences that are there are critical to the success of, of every team, every company. So, you oh, know, but the first word was inclusive, yeah. Sorry. I know a tiny bit about your Berkman scores, although I haven't actually seen the report, but, but I know that operations is not what gets you up in the morning and wakes you up and gets you so excited. Yeah. It's not operations. How have you handled that? By getting a really top-notch general manager here whose job it is. I Oh, and what, what I actually was, was going to tell you a minute ago, the five words are starting with inclusive, humble, resilient, compassionate, and curious. And, and I wrote a little, we have a little mouse pad that has all these five on here in a little short definition of what we mean by each one, uh, which I'm happy to share with anybody that's interested. But as you said, operations I know are terribly important. I also recognize that it's not my forte. So I have delegated that to our different department heads and, and we meet regularly. And we, now that we're able to be back in the office a good bit of the time, we still generally have everyone on the same day, but we do have the gift of private offices for each person and large meeting spaces for social distancing when needed. And so we are now feeling we're, we're about 70, 80 percent feeling back to normal. And boy, it's wonderful. I'm so happy. Well, I, I know the Berkmans used all over the world. And some of the questions that people have is, is there any difference in how someone is going to respond maybe from Saudi, because I met this lovely woman from there at the yeah. convention right before COVID, or, or men and women. People are always asking, um, are we going to score differently? Can you tell us about that? I'd be happy to. Interestingly enough, when you really dig deeper than the surface, what we call the learned behavior, and every culture naturally has its own learned behavior. That's the way we live as humans. We learn from our tribe, whatever that country, whatever that community is. Even look at the diversity of styles uh, from, this, from one state to another in the U.S. But to your question, what we have seen, this is really interesting, and our PhD, Dr. Kelly Slack, actually did a whole uh, keynote on what that looks like. We see minor differences between say the Middle East on each component and US, but what doesn't change is the kind of directional shape of it. So you could say that we're actually very, very similar and it would be impossible to pick up a, a copy of the Berkman profile that has a, it has a there's a synopsis page where you can see all the scores on one sheet. And I would there is no way that a trained certified Berkman consultant could pick up a sheet of paper and look at all those all those percentages and scores and determine if that was male, female, old, young, Middle Eastern, U.S., Latin America. I mean, there is no way to tell because people at the end of the day are remarkably similar. So to your question, the differences are so minor that statistically a, a, a psychologist would say they're not significant. Okay. And, and men, men and women and their needs. Now their learned behavior is another matter. You know, we're all familiar with the, you know, boys are taught to try to control their emotions. Girls are thought to be more emotional. Girls and, and boys, male and female on the Berkman, can score in remarkably similar ways, however. I've seen that. Differences. I have coached the most emotional men, and they're more emotional 
than the women business owners I know. By the way, my mentor, Margaret Wick, I, is on the line. Thank yeah. you for joining us. Um, how do you see the Berkman helping people starting out in a career or finding a college major, for mm. instance? I think what it does, what I've seen over the years is it will not spell out exactly what job you should be pigeonholed into. But what it can really help with is, is directional guidance. Uh, one of the things that we were able to do about 10 years ago is connect all of our career job families and job titles to the United States Out Occupational Outlook, which is a, it's, a, it's a, provided by the US Department of Labor. It's very detailed. And on our career report, you can actually just click on a link and at no charge go directly into the ONET and see from your Berkman, your, your top career matches. And the way that's derived, Jean, is that we, uh, we calculated from people's satisfaction in a job, in a, in a career, when they said they were happy or there was long tenure in that, we assumed they did okay. And we compared the responses on each one of the Berkman questions to people that were in those particular jobs. And from that, we calculated 22 job families. These families are huge in the US Department of Labor, containing thousands and thousands of job titles. But what we can provide from just one report is your top six job family matches. And if you want more detail than that, we can go into the career exploration report and get even more into the, to the details of the careers. But it's all, what, what I love about that is we're the only ones that actually combine interpersonal with career, mm -hmm. or said a different way, in one fell swoop, you're looking at both occupational and interpersonal relationship uh, matters and how they combine at your work. That's interesting. You know, for me, um, when that was done, I was asked to take um, the assessment again. It takes about 30 minutes um, if you shoot from the hip. And that's what I was told I was supposed to do. You're supposed to do that. Yeah. yeah. And my career report came out slightly different. I mean, before, early on, like in 1986, it yes, was more a yeah. minister, a counselor, a teacher. Well, I... I love sales. I've been in sales my whole life and I love equipment. I'm not very mechanical, but I'm fascinated by it. And it came out that I should be selling oil field equipment. And that would have been my dream job. I, I didn't even know what oil field equipment was when I started my career. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, but yeah. That, that's when Dr. Patrick Wadlington did yeah. all this renorming to the ONET to the uh, Department of Labor website. It was, it was fascinating. Um, I know from being on many of these on Friday, we have a lot of coaches and, and consultants um, who consult mm -hmm. at C-suite levels. We also have coaches, we have life coaches on here, um, a lot of consultants and coaches. What, you know, how would they use in, in kind of a small or medium business, how would they use the Berkman? Um, well, I think, you know, from a coaching standpoint, it could possibly be used for career transition. I mean, we, it happens all the time or, or internally with the corporation for career pathing. We actually train, here's what we do. Our business model is about 80% just provide the Berkman assessment and make sure that everything's running smoothly for people in 24 languages around the, the globe. So that's a, that's our the body of our of our work each day. And equally as important though, about 20% is making sure that our certified trained coaches and consultants that come from all different industries and are all over the world are supported with the best learning possible. So, you know, the initial certification gets them started. And then we try to do, we've of course been limited more to webinars, but we'll get back to in-person classes. Again, we are now easing into it and to conferences and all kinds of ways that we can help empower our consultant network because I know that's really half of the equation. 
the data is is important that they're working with and it has to be reliable valid and sound and that's my job here but the person who's sitting down like you or like donna or any certified berkman consultant is really they're making the magic happen because they're having that all important conversation we call it we don't call it feedback or debrief we call it that coaching conversation where they look at the data they talk to that unique individual and they make the data come alive in the context of that person's life. And I, I think the happiest part of my job, I got the most beautiful letter just yesterday about how the, that combination of reliable psychological data about what's going to really engage and recharge and keep that individual mentally and physically healthy, how that combined with a a top-notch coach consultant just literally saved his life and saved his his um, his big company that had 700 employees. He said, "If it weren't for Berkman, I think I would have lost my company during COVID." Wow! And made- that is, he knew how to address the needs mm-hmm. of the, the yeah, thing in fact, that he sees. Yeah, what what the example he gave, and this is important, he discovered that in terms of decision making, he was the founder and CEO of this of this corporation. And he said, I learned from my Berkman that I have a high need for thought when I'm in stress. And in the danger of that is, well, let me put it this way. The good side of that is that he's not going to be too impulsive. He's not going to take a crazy risk. He's going to think things through carefully. The danger, though, at a crisis is sometimes you have to take action quickly or there will be terrible consequences. So he said in in that crisis, he realized that managing his high thought stress need was what what actually saved him from losing the company at that moment where it was at such risk. So it's that it's the needs. That's where then that's what a coach can point out for better self-care because that's really what it serves to do and how in a moment it also measures how we're going to show up in our stress so when there is life will always prevent stressful situations it's just called normal life right yes we all we all know about that and and we all but we all express it in our own particular individual personal ways and by recognizing we can't we can manage it it's impossible to handle what you can't see. And, and, but once you can recognize it and you're not in denial, you can actually do a, a great job like this young man did of, of coming through the crisis with flying colors. Yeah. And an example um, for me, I'm the only person I know that was thrilled to be um, secluded. <laughs> Um, oh yeah, that's that, it, that low social that energy. Need. Best three months of my life. <laughs> you know, I'm socialized as an extrovert. Um, in my family, if you were not an extrovert, you didn't get to be in the family. <clears throat> so you learn that very early that you know you you have to be um, attentive and hopefully at some point charming. And it's sort of like. <laughs> Um, I give the impression, please invite me to your party. I don't want to come. But you want to be invited, right? Yeah, I want to be invited, but I don't want to be at a party. Um, I don't want to be around a lot of people. And I did not know that until 1986. Well, I'm so glad you said that because, again, most uh, people will feel like they either have to be classified as an extrovert or as an introvert because we've now popularized those were psychological terms years ago but now everybody knows what they mean the truth of the matter is that the vast majority of us i would say 90 percent of us are actually a complex blend of the two and every component on the berkman is either you know when you look at both sides of it we yeah. are both, we're not either or, we are both and. So yeah. uh, the, a very common pattern 
it, that you've just cited is people will say, well, I I'm social and I like being around people uh, maybe all day at work. But boy, when I get done, I don't want to go out again in the evening with the team. I just want to go home and relax with maybe on my own or with my significant other or with a friend. I want mm-hmm. some quiet time, some downtime. That is what recharges me not more socializing. There are a few individuals that just don't run out of social energy. They eventually run out of physical energy. <laughs> so they, they eventually have to get some rest. But my daughter, I, my youngest daughter is high, high social energy. Most people will say I'm, I'm pretty social, but I need some downtime. But then there's also a segment of the population that says, you know what? I'm low, low, low usual, low need. So frankly, I would be happy if I could always work from home and only make me come to a meeting when absolutely necessary. Uh, Yeah. uh, But most of us kind of fall into that. I like a little of this and I like a little of that. And the important thing is being able to recognize what we need and make sure that we just like you provide your own amount of, of nutrition, water, sleep, exercise. If you, also honor your interpersonal needs. Wow, what a difference it can make in your well-being. I call it the need. It's like a vitamin. Yeah, yes, it is. And the interest, by the way, uh, thank you for bringing that up. One of our our longtime corporate consultants, he said one time, Sharon, when I talk about people's interests on the Berkman, I call it the vitamins for your soul. And so we look at those top interests we measure 10 different areas that are very universal across across all the cultures. Uh, and they're big, they're big areas of interest. And, and we measure these, these 10 and give you your top ones and say, if it's not part of your job, please include it in your private life because it will just make your life a whole lot healthier and happier. It will. And we have a question from Jane Benkendorf. Okay. That, that's Benkendorf. Yes. <laughs> A good German name. My husband's from Nuremberg. So, yeah. Um, She asked if we have training here person to person in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Well, we do have, uh, we don't go on the road right now. We we do have uh, in-person training here in Houston. And and before COVID, we would travel to uh, to Atlanta each year or to Washington State or, or L.A., However, what we did during COVID is pivot to the virtual option. So we have the, an offering where you can, you can uh, sign up, you do some prep work with online learning about the, techno- the, excuse me, the terminology, and then you work with a very, very seasoned, experienced Berkman trainer consultant on Zoom for five days straight. Now, it's, it's, it's a, vir- a big virtual one, but between Monday and Friday, you can become Berkman certified. And there's a little follow-up online afterward. Uh, but we're also, in 2022, going to be offering several in-person ones here in the office, which, per- for me, I think it's, it's ideal if you're able to travel. But the virtual is another option for those who really need to do it virtually. You said five days. Is that five days, eight hours a day? No, it's it's two and a half hours in the morning and two and a half hours in the afternoon. Okay, for five. And, and the uh, in person is three days. Uh, it's online, eight hours of modules that you do over thirty day period. Okay. Uh, it's your it's your own pace, and then that allows you to arrive prepared for the in person one. That's three days only. We used them Tuesday morning through Thursday afternoon. Okay. Uh, Thank you. And Amy Kessler has a question, and she applauds what you are doing at Berkman. And who are Berkman's ideal clients? Oh, okay. Well, we have really two kinds of certified consultants in our thousands of consultants out there. About half of them are independent solo practitioners, Amy. In other words, they are their own boss. Uh, They go, they're self-employed and they go from contract to contract or from client to client. And they, they work with anybody they choose to work with in their area or internationally. You know, it's just up to them. They call the shots. Then we have another kind of Berkman client consultant that is 
an internal employee. For We've worked with a, a number of global companies. I'm really not supposed to say this, but their names everybody would recognize. Um, so I always, I'm tempted to rattle them off because everyone would know these companies, but they have multiple certified people internally scattered in ge different geographical regions or wherever they have their headquarters. These are our corporate consultants. And then we have, like I say, the independent consultants. What is interesting for me is that the most successful applications tend to come about in a situation where, say, the, um, the, the ABC company can bring in Gene or, or someone like Donna as a, an independent consultant because they serve different purposes. Mm -hmm. And when you combine the internal with the external consultant, it really has a, a powerful chemistry that, that works beautifully. What I mean by that is the internal person can be that go-to on a kind of weekly, monthly basis to do maybe lunch and learns, meet one-on-one -on -one with them. If, a, if an employee, kind of like HR, if an employee's having a, a, a situation, a conflict with a teammate, they can sit down right away and address it. The external consultant, the independent one, can come in maybe two, three, four times a year and do special events with the whole team. Or the, or the CEO at C-suite. And so they who don't get a paycheck from the corporation have a role to play as a SME, as a, as a you know, subject matter expert for the Berkman, representing how they not only know Berkman, but they know how to coach executives. They know how to work with teams. And they bring all of that expertise in. And, and really, that is the most wonderful and powerful way to apply Berkman in a company. Okay, I wanted to add that there are a tremendous amount of numbers that if you get certified, you see lots of numbers. I did not have stat in any of my classes and I was still able to get certified. You don't have to understand every single thing. You just kind of have to understand how it works, mm -hmm. how it works how to use it. Um, can you tell us a story about, uh, you tell one, I'll tell one, about how it changed someone's life. I mean, like, totally. Okay, well, this is, I, I did actually come out with a new book. I think you bought it, Creatures of Contact, uh -huh. Why You Need More Than a Personality Test. And, <laughs> and that really addresses our vital need for healthy relationships. And what I said earlier about how it's not just about the stats and the data it's and, and the libraries that we write. It's also about those really beneficial coaching conversations that our certified people bring to the table. But what happened year, some years ago, my husband was working, he was singing at the Met. So I was visiting him in New York and we went to see an event and I was standing in line to greet the speaker at that event. And when I got to the speaker, I introduced myself and a lady standing right next to me said, oh, are you Berkman from that Berkman test? And I'm going, uh oh, <laughs> I, I hope she had a good experience because I have no idea what she's going to say and who she is. And uh, she said, oh, I have a story to tell you. And I went, OK, <laughs> kind of holding my breath for a moment. And she said, I work for the Junior League of New York City. And, and that was one of our, you know, one of our important clients at the time. And she said, I just want you to know that I had a lady in my, on my team that I swear, I think she just got up in the morning to irritate me. <laughs> she just woke up thinking, how can I make my life miserable every single day? And I mean, they really had a vendetta going. And, and she said, and then... One day, one of your Berkman consultants arrived and we did Berkman's on the two of us and the rest of our team. And you know what happened? All of a sudden, I realized it wasn't really about me at all. It was that she had a different perception and style and a different gift, in fact, and she brought value to the team that I wasn't seeing. But once I saw that, it broke down that defensiveness and all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, I think gradually over time, she was able to actually become friends with the lady. And she said, we even have lunch together sometimes now. 
<laughs> and she grinned. And I said, I just want to thank you for making my life at work so much more bearable by giving me that understanding of my colleague. Oh, that's good. And, and my story, and I have permission to tell this story um, because he tells it to everybody. Uh, <laughs> Mark Bazanson was the president of uh, Patriot Bank here. And um, the board of directors sent him to me. And I remember the very first thing I said to him, I mean, I, I just listened to him for like 30 minutes. Mm. And I said, uh, you're a good talker. Do you ever listen? <laughs> and um, later his wife thanked me for that because uh, he took that home. But what he was doing is he did not have his heart connected with his head. You know, he didn't have his needs connected, mm. but he did for a living. And he's former military and um, his whole life changed. And when his mother died, I was at the, the service and um, his brothers and sisters, who is that? Who is that Gene Kelly? Because I want to meet her. <laughs> it cascaded through his entire life. So it, it can be a life changer. Now he was motivated though. I want to make that point. Mm -hmm. If the person that you're coaching is motivated, you can take them through the roof, but if they're not, you're not going to get anywhere. No, no. People have to be open. You know, it, it, a number of years ago, Brene Brown popularized the term vulnerability. Well, that's just a form of being open to hearing what you need to hear. And it's always the challenge of a good coach. If they put up defenses and refuse to hear it, Sometimes people will say, I didn't hear it at the beginning. Later on, as life happened, I started being more open to it. And now we do say we cannot, we do not administer the Berkman to any young people. They have to be at least 16 years old. And we prefer, if you want to get a more accurate, full picture of that young adult, it's better to be at least 18 or 18 to 21 where you start to have a little bit more, not only life experience, but frankly, from a neuroscience standpoint, the prefrontal cortex is still in formation in the teen years. And as they get more of the brain development under, under, you know, under the years, over the years, um, you will get a more accurate. You can get a good sense of where they're headed if you do it younger, and it can be helpful if needed. But if you want to really get a more stable young adult, 20, 21 is in any in and up for girls, maybe for boys, even a little older, mid 20s, they're saying now. But that doesn't mean you can't get helpful information, even as they leaving high school. Because frankly, it's like looking at their photograph, they're going to look younger, but they're not going to look different altogether. Yeah. Um, it's a snapshot in time. Yes. Young. yes. I'm going to do an experiment with a very mature 13-year-old girl who has had 21 surgeries. Mm. She's an old soul. Yeah. And this is what, I'm going to see how that works out. Um, we have a question from Ruth uh, Rolf or Rolfe, if you're from Germany. Um, um. Can you talk about how Berkman was used with religious organizations and also SMU? Mm. Oh, sure. Yes, we worked with the uh, Perkins School of Theology at SMU, and we work with a lot of college faculty and students, uh, too many to name. But that's one of my passions because I, I, they're our future, these, these young college kids. Um, so I'm glad you're doing that, Jean. But my dad uh, believes, I mean, coming from the background he did, believed that faith-based was so important too. We work with many, many churches. We just got a message this week that the Methodist Conference here in Texas wants to bring in a Berkman consultant to be a Berkman specialist. Um, so, you know, we don't have time today, but it is a big part of what we do is the nonprofits, the faith-based the educational, uh, it's, it's frankly my sweet spot because that's where my heart really goes. But at the same time, you know, what happens sometimes people will come to a business certification and then they'll say, uh, I need it for my corporate account, but I also would like you to set up a separate 
uh, account for me just to do with my my children's school or my church group or my Sunday school class. It happens all the time. So and, um, I hope that, that answers discounted, the question. Right. Excuse me. Uh, uh, discounted right if it's a church. Well, there's not a special nonprofit pricing, but okay. they, but we do have options that are less expensive if if that's a problem. And once in a while, if it's a if the consultant wants to donate their own time, then we can donate maybe 10 or 20 cues. And we, excuse me, we call that Berkman Gives Back and it's part of our community service. So that's a case by case. Oh, that is so nice. You do that in Oklahoma. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I did that for Goodwill, by the way. I'm on the board as well. You and yeah. I have that in common. We We're are both big believers in the power of work for Goodwill. And, and also a hand up and not a hand out. Yes, that's that right. A, yes. Uh, pretty big yeah. goal. And, and frankly, the only reason we can't have a standard nonprofit price is because some of our big accounts are like Methodist Hospital and MD Anderson, which are multi-billion dollar companies, really, even though they're a nonprofit. And it just got too messy. So the way we handle it is the way I just outlined, and it's working really well. Oh, that's good. Um, Donna's on here. Donna, you need to tell me when I need to quit. We're, yeah, we're almost out of time, aren't we? Yeah, you're doing well. You got a few more minutes. Okay. Any more questions? Good. Oh, I always have questions. Um, how does the Berkman help you with your husband? Uh, well, we, we find <clears throat> if they've been married for a while, uh, I would love to see uh, engaged couples look at each other's Berkman and uh -huh. really understand each other in that deeper, more meaningful way about how each one is similar and different. And we have a few who do it, use it for that. The biggest challenge with engaged couples is they may be more focused on the honeymoon and what they're going to serve at the reception and how the dress looks. Uh, huh. But when they've been married three or four years, those rose colored glasses are starting to get a little clearer. And we have done a lot of work at, in our community with, in fact, one of our consultants specializes in doing Berkman for married couples. Mm -hmm. and, and we have many consultants out there. Again, that's one of their many applications of Berkman is to work with couples. And I could tell you stories I've had over the years about how people say it actually probably saved my marriage. And I thought after 20 years, I knew everything there was to know about my spouse. Berkman taught me something I didn't realize. So that's always happy to always happy to hear those moments and it's a good wedding gift for mm. people who are certified and that's kind of what I do as a wedding gift because I I never know what to get but it's pretty helpful yeah and you know if they would just even if they listen to it and talk about it and then lay it aside and bring it out a little bit later it'll probably mean even more over the years than that fancy plate or that pretty vase. So I think that's a fabulous wedding gift, Jean. Thank you for doing that. You know, it, it's sort of like um, any really important book, like the Bible, the Quran. Um, um, how you see it, what you read is going to change as you change, mm -hmm. um, as your values change, and as you get older and have you have more data points. Um, one thing about the Berkman you know, it really is unique and how someone, everybody's heard the term perception is reality. Mm -hmm. It's true. Um, what someone is perceiving is their own yeah. reality. Before we run out of time, I do want to throw in one statistic. This is very simple. And that is what we're finding from our own data is that 70% of the time we as humans behave in such a way that is not necessarily the same as how we want to be treated. So if you say, I'm just going to do, I'm going to treat everybody by the golden rule, which is a good thing. You know, you want to be kind, but uh, at a deeper level, interpersonal level, in the complexity of relationships, that doesn't always work. You have to treat them with the platinum rule, we call it, as they need to be treated, not as you need to be treated, because they may not align. And so Berkman reveals that root system that you don't easily see and, and if or that you can get to there more quickly 
with a relationship or with a spouse or with a hire, if you've got the data to look at that makes it neither good nor bad, just real. Yes. And then then you've got this rule that uh, do it to them before they do it to you. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. can help calm that down a little because yeah. I've worked with a lot of people that they're right in there. They want to get you first. But yeah. then, you know, the awareness of, of a consultant or a spouse, uh, really, it really helps the relationship. Yeah. Just one week ago, uh, I pulled up, you know, because you and I, we're able to go to, to Boston and enjoy that Harvard thing. Two researchers from Harvard uh, just wrote a nice short article about what people really want in a good CEO is a listener. And they said more than financial savvy, more than operational skills, they want good empathy and social skills. And they did 17 years of study to come up with that, which we already knew. But it's nice to see that it's been validated by, by Harvard researchers. Yeah. Well, my mentor that I mentioned, she's why I went to Harvard. So, yeah, it's a good experience. Hi, Donna. There's Donna. I, I bet the time clock's running out. <laughs> it is. You guys have done a wonderful job. And I want to say personally, I love the Berkman. I, I wasn't kidding when I said my husband makes me raise my right hand when I talk about it. <laughs> it just explains everything. It really does. Thanks, Donna. Thank you. So thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. Learned a lot. Gene, thank you so much for sponsoring and acting as our host. Um, any final words of wisdom, like your key learnings you want people to come away with? Well, I think I want them to know that Berkman is all about us showing self-care and compassion, not just to ourselves, but to everybody that, that we live and work with. And if they want to learn more, please just... You can, you can email me personally, S Berkman, S-B-I-R-K-M-A-N at Berkman.com, which is pretty easy. Or you can just go to our website, Berkman.com and find more, more material on our resource center and read about all the many ways that this can be applied. Because frankly, you know, anytime you have more than one person working together, this instrument can be helpful. And thank you so much for letting me join you today. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, I am. I want to comment on that. The group process, understanding group dynamics is the real strength of the Berkman, from my perspective. You mm -hmm. get people understanding that and they start laughing and going, okay, now I get it. I understand. Yeah. That. Um, yeah. And one thing I failed to mention, we have a new product that we launched just before COVID called High Performing Teams, which is based on Dr. Amy Edmondson's pillars of psychological safety, purpose, and clarity, and combining the, the top Berkman differentiators from your own personal report into how that impacts those three important pillars. So, and, and you, it's really easy to learn. Um, my daughter, Amy, just recorded a, an e-learning video so that anybody can get trained to do this very easily. And it's working beautifully. Now, even on, on Zoom, it's, we didn't think it was possible, but you know, it can work. Hey, you, you gotta do it. Okay, well, thank you again for being here. It's been terrific. No, um, thank you, ladies and okay. gentlemen. Yes, yes, yes. Um, upcoming shows. Just FYI, on November 12th, I've got LaFaris Risby. Um, she just was recognized as Enterprising Women's World Top Entrepreneur. Um, we've got networking coming up on the 19th. Normally, it's the fourth Friday of the month. We're doing it early because of the holiday. Mm. And then uh, I've got Jerry Solomons coming on on December 3rd, and he's a Kigali-based consultant who focuses on gender equity and balance from a male activist perspective. So mm. that's what we've got coming up. Interesting. Okay, uh, please do buy from women-owned and women-led businesses like the Berkman, like Jean Kelly here. Um, please like and share our social media pages. Uh, please let your friends know about this webcast. We try to get at the very best guests we possibly can. We get some really high-level people nationally coming on the show, and it's a great opportunity to interact with them directly, hear from some experts. And uh, please do remember, first power, we have it. Let's use it. Anything else? Share it or Jean? I'm just appreciating your background there, Donna. Uh, love it. I, I think Berkman is all about social connection. At the end of the day, that's how we survive. And we want to do a good, good job of it. Absolutely. So thank you so much for, for allowing me to be your guest. Absolutely. Thank you again, you guys. Have a great week, and we'll see you next Friday. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.